Well, one quick announcement before we get into this uh, passage today. Um, I normally love to shake your guys' hands and hug you guys at the door. Uh, I'm not going to do that for just a little bit. Uh, not just for me, but like our whole staff got sick. I was deathly ill on Friday. Um, talked to a nurse from our church, and they, she's telling me that like there's this RSV going on even in adults. And so um, I just, if you're last on the line and I shake your hand, uh, I'm going to hand you every germ in this church. So you don't want that for you or for anybody. Uh, and also, side note, if you walk through there and I give you a hug and I smell like booze, it's not because I've been drinking. It's because because our hand sanitizer is straight tequila, and it just stinks, so it's pretty pungent, so just to let everyone know that. But So we are doing uh, four weeks in the passage where Jesus is tempted by Satan, and if you were with us last week, I talked about how this is actually a picture of our life, that before Jesus went into his ministry, uh, it says the Spirit took him in the desert to be trained, and he is, as our model, he is giving us a model um, in, in these disciplines, and the early church fathers believed in discipline. Discipline is a bad word to us, and it's actually a wonderful word. Discipline is what makes you stronger. Discipline is what helps you achieve your goals. Discipline has become an awful word in our society, but it's a wonderful word that helps you grow. And um, as I said before, oftentimes at this church, we're grace church, grace church, grace and grace alone, but that doesn't mean following Jesus is easy. It's hard following Jesus. It's hard giving up things that you believe. It's hard uh, giving up fleshly things. It's tough following Jesus, but there's a, a lifelong process of disciplines uh, that we are called to do. And the early church fathers called this ascesis. That, that Greek word ascesis in English means exercise in combat. And so we are to do these disciplines and these practices uh, so that we can be ready for the world. But as I said last week, sometimes we flip this. Uh, if, if you're into martial arts, people who go into martial arts, they don't do it so they can go kick someone's butt. That's, that, you'll go to jail for that. You do it so you can defend. It's not about being a tough guy and going out and mopping people up. It's if case that event happens, then you can defend the innocent. And so that's what this is all about as well, is, is we're not doing this so we can go out there and just be these crazy people. It's so when times do happen, we have composure, we have discipline, and we have balance in our life. And so that's why uh, these disciplines that we're talking about are incredibly important. Olivier Clement says this. He says, the purpose of ascesis, you know, combat, is thus to divest oneself of surplus weight, of spiritual fat. So we train to get rid of spiritual fat. It is to dissolve in the waters of baptism, in the water of tears, all the hardness of the heart, so that it may become an antenna of infinite sensitivity, infinitely vulnerable to the beauty of the world and to the sufferings of human beings and to God who is love, who has conquered by the word of his cross. So we do these disciplines to to mature, to grow closer to God, but it's also to soften our hearts. It's also to become Christ-like. So one discipline that we are taught in the church, and if you're new in the church, this is uh, just one thing that's, that's tradition, and that is using the Holy Scriptures, reading the Bible. Reading the Bible is a discipline. It's something that helps you grow closer to God. It's something that helps you understand God better. Reading the Bible is incredibly important, and the Bible is called a sword, it's actually called the sword many times uh, throughout the scriptures. One of the most famous ones is Hebrews 4.12. It says, for the word of God is living and active, meaning it's, it's relevant to every generation, and sharper than any two-edged sword, even penetrating as far as the division of soul and spirit, and both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. My father told me this story where my dad was a big time hunter. He traveled all over the world and we had lots of mounts. <laughs> and uh, that was his passion. And he told me this story once where he was actually elk hunting um, right over here on the Idaho Montana border. But it was way back in there. They had to take horses from St. Regis. I mean, they were going way back in there. Um, and he got teamed up, like he hired this guide, and he got teamed up with these two brothers who were bull riders. And uh, you're, you can't be a sissy and be a bull rider. Let's put it that way. He was saying these dudes were tough as nails. And this one of the brothers shot an elk, 
And I, my dad actually has a journal where he wrote this in there. And this guy shoots an elk, and while he pulls out this massive machete, basically, like this huge hunting knife with a, you know, a bone handle, just like the best knife. And it was super sharp, and he was in there gutting that elk, and that knife slipped, and he jammed himself directly in the forehead. Like... The knife went through his forehead, and he, my dad said he just was like in shock. And the guy was running around with this knife in his head, and his brother grabbed the frying pan and knocked his brother out and got on top and pulled this knife out of his head while he was knocked out, wrapped it all up. They had to put him on the horse and get out, and uh, my dad stayed and shot a bull elk, you know, brave dad. But... <laughs> That's crazy, right? Like, that's a crazy story. But my point is, is you need a good knife to, do, to, to gut an elk. However, a knife can be helpful, but also hurtful. It can help you, but it can also be used as a weapon. So is the Bible. So is the Bible. The Bible can be used as a weapon, and many, many times it is. It can be used to divide people instead of bring people together. It can be used as a weapon out of context and hurt people. In America alone, we have 4,000 denominations. 4,000 denominations, and they're all using the same book. And they divide over certain passages, they divide over certain theologies, and everyone thinks they're right. So who's right out of 4,000? And is that even the question we should be asking? N.T. Wright, one of the most world-renowned theologians right now, he said, people often get upset when you teach them what is actually in the Bible and not what they presume is in the Bible. So for two weeks, we're going to look at the Bible, and I'm going to show you why in a minute when we read this passage in the desert. This week, we're just going to look at what the Bible is, and we're going to look at a little history of it. So um, the, every one of you in this room probably has a different opinion on this. And really, we need to come to uh, an agreement on how to yield this sword to be helpful. This is a sword. So how do we use it in a proper way? How do we train to use this weapon in the right way to heal? And if, in full disclosure, and I said this at the nine, um, I'm afraid to preach on this. I'm scared. I, I want this day to be over. <laughs> I don't feel good. And I have seen the last few years has been very contentious with this book. I've seen a lot of division. I've seen a lot of anger. I've seen a lot of slander. I've seen a lot of arrogance. And I've seen a lot of people try and defend this book while acting very unchristlike, which in which the book points to. And I myself have made the same mistake. I have used this, especially in my early years, as I was trained to be a certain way uh, through a certain denomination, to use this as a weapon. I have hurt people with this book. And my ego was stoked that I thought I was right. But I ruined relationships and I did wrong. And I've repented of that. But I can tell you, this subject is so touchy and it's obvious by the 4,000 denominations alone in America. So we're going to look at this week just what the Bible is. Next week, we're going to look at Jesus as the Word of God. And so I'm begging you to process this and think about this and, and pray about it. But let me just start by saying this. The Bible is my favorite book. If it wasn't around, I would have nothing to preach and I would be out of a job. <laughs> I love the Bible. I believe the Bible is God's inspired Word. And it is, it is a gift given to man. It came at the right time when people could write, um, and here's why I actually believe he chose a book. See, some people ask, why wouldn't Jesus come nowadays when we could broadcast his sermons on live stream? I believe it's proven scientifically that reading makes you smarter. It just does. Some of you don't like to read. That's okay. Now you got YouTube and podcasts, and I think that helps too. But reading makes you smarter. They say the top CEOs read like a stupid amount of books every year. It just whatever you read makes you smarter. So I believe God gave us a book that no matter where you're at, you can be smarter. But here's, this, here's the difference. There's a difference between intelligence and wisdom. We have a lot of people who have a lot of degrees out there. That doesn't mean they're smart. That means you can regurgitate facts. It might mean they're smart, but there's a difference between intelligence and wisdom. This book is meant to give us wisdom. Wisdom. 
That's why we read this book. So I love this book. I've never studied it more than I do now. I mean, I'm talking thousands and thousands of hours every year. I, I, I wake up and I read this book. I love it. But it is a weapon. It is a weapon. So let me just say this. No matter where you land on what I say today, I'm open to conversation and let's not use this as a weapon. But I also wanna say this. One thing I buck against the Western evangelical church is when they say America needs to return to biblical values. America does not need to return to biblical values. We are called to be Christ-like. Christ-like. There's a difference because there's a lot of things that he was working with the Jews in the Old Testament that have nothing to do with you and me. And we can go to those verses and we can find it, but it has nothing to do with us. We can gain wisdom from it, but we can't say that God is speaking this to us. Meaning, if I told you that the Lord spoke to me, thus saith the Lord, that I need to go round up Zootown Church and we need to go invade Frenchtown and take it over. Anybody from Frenchtown here? You're like, good luck, good luck. <laughs> what would you say? You're like, this dude's crazy. Well, we have a whole book of people saying that God told them that. So we are called to be Christ-like. And that's why we're doing these next few sermons. So, Jesus is tempted in the desert. Satan told him he's, he was hungry. He didn't eat for 40 days. Satan told him to make stones into bread. And Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone. And the whole point of the message last week is Christ is still speaking to you. It's not just the Bible. His voice, he lives inside of you, and he is speaking to you, and you live. You are spiritual, and you are to live off the spirit, not the flesh. And we pick up the story in verse 9. And he brought him, actually, let's pray first. Lord Jesus, I'm afraid, so help me. And unify this body. No matter where people land, let us be unified in the words of Jesus, your words in the Gospels. In your name, amen. And he brought him into Jerusalem, and he had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, <clears throat> throw yourself down from here, for it is written... He will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will lift you up so that you don't strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said, It has also been written, You shall not put the Lord God to the test. You got Satan quoting Psalm 91. Is it truth? Yeah. And then you got Jesus quoting Deuteronomy 6 both using the Bible to prove a point, which one's right? Jesus is always right, okay? That's the easiest, that's the easiest lesson in children's, uh, kids in the zoo. Jesus is always right. But they both used the Bible. They both used the scriptures. Again, this has been a contentious few years for me, um, and I try to show grace because I've been in some of those positions as well. But, my friend Baxter Kruger, who is a wonderful theologian, a genius in the Greek language, he said, he calls them scripture wars. He kind of laughs at it now. He's like, it's just scripture wars. All, all these Christians are just doing scripture wars. You throw out a scripture, and then I throw out a scripture, and then you throw out a scripture, and then I throw out a scripture, and we both walk away being like, I'm right. That guy's going to hell for sure. Because we can have alternative scriptures in this book to prove our point. And if you've grown up in church, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Those are scripture wars, and they've accomplished nothing. They've accomplished nothing but caused a lot of division. We are trained in the West that theology is everything. We've replaced a relationship in many ways with facts, with, with, with knowledge. That if you just... Memorize some of these verses, that's important. Now, I believe you should memorize verses, but we're trained in theological pride. And here's how I know. The same people who believe in the same book, you can go on YouTube, seriously do it. Go type in any of your favorite preachers, and there is a YouTube channel dedicated to them that they're a heretic. All of them. And this is why, because they're mistranslating this verse, and they're not using this verse. And then the next guy's being like, yeah, but you're not using this verse. So everybody's a heretic in America. Because we have been trained that theology is the most important thing. Now, let me be very clear. Bad theology can hurt you, but perfect theology cannot save you. The Pharisees tried that. 
The Pharisees tried that. They knew the Bible. Dude, to be a Pharisee, you had to memorize the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, to memorize it. These guys were sharp. They were intelligent. They knew scripture. They threw it at Jesus. And he's like, you're wrong. So bad theology can hurt you. I'm not saying theology doesn't matter, but perfect theology cannot save you. Jesus saves you. The person of Jesus Christ. And what this passage proves to me is that you can quote scripture, you can know a lot of scripture, and you can still be on the side of Satan. Because you can cut people. You can hurt people. You can use these in a prideful, arrogant way and rather a healing way. And I've done it. I'll give you an example. You got some hard times going on in your life. You got things that are insurmountable. You have anxiety. You, I mean, you got divorced, whatever it is. You lost your job. And someone comes to you and says... God won't give you more than you can handle. In that moment, it feels like it. God will, I mean, because we've been trained, and I think it's with good hearts. I know people have good hearts. That we think as Christians, we always have to give an answer. And we've missed the fact that sometimes the best thing we can do is get on our knee and just listen. And just weep with those who weep. That doesn't help. Well, God chose you for this because he knew you could handle it. That whole verse, if you read the context, is about temptation. He won't give you more temptation than you can handle. Another one that I see a lot of football and NBA players, they always have Philippians on their shoe and it says, I can do all things through Christ. Amen. That verse is about temptation. It means you can defeat any temptation. It doesn't mean you're gonna go to the NFL. <laughs> it doesn't mean you're gonna be a millionaire. It means Christ goes with you through all things, but you can't name it and claim it for that. See how you can use this out of context. So here's just a quick, quick history. This was oral tradition. They passed down oral tradition for thousands of years, and in about a thousand year span, they compiled some of these books. There is a misconception that it was one author, and a lot of people think these guys sat down and wrote these whole books in one sitting. That's not how this went. This was years and years and years compiling these books. There was a lot of different voices into these books. I'll give you an example. We're told that Moses wrote the Torah. Well, in the Torah, it says, Moses was the most humble man who ever lived. If Moses wrote that, he's not the most humble man who ever lived. Someone wrote that in, and that's okay. But there were tons and tons and tons of views. If you read uh, any of the Jewish perspectives, there's like 70 viewpoints on Leviticus alone, and there are no original manuscripts. We have zero original manuscripts. They have been copied after copied. There's fragments, and some of those fragments put together don't agree with each other, so they do their best to try to make it work. What's important in the Old Testament for sure are the prophecies of Jesus Christ. That is how, on the road to Emmaus, he says he started with the Old Testament, everything concerning with himself. He was, he was dividing the word of truth, and that's what was important in the Old Testament. But there's much wisdom to be gained in the Old Testament. I'm not saying this. But here's one phrase I've heard that I've used, okay? Here's, here's in the scripture wars. Here goes, here's what we say. The Bible is clear. If you've read Genesis to Revelation... Is it always? The Bible is clear. And then I say, well, yeah, but it says right here. And then you said, yeah, but it says right here. And it says, well, which one? I love how one person breaks this down. They say, the Bible is clear. Moabites are bad. They live in French town. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> they were not to be allowed to dwell among God's people. Deuteronomy 23, no Moabites. But then comes the story of Ruth. The Moabite, which challenges the prejudice against Moabites. The Bible is clear. People from Uz, what a great name, are evil. Jeremiah 25. But then comes the story of Job, a man from Uz who was the most blameless man on earth. The Bible is clear. No foreigners or eunuchs allowed. Deuteronomy 23. But then comes a story of an African eunuch welcomed into the church in Acts 8. The Bible is clear. God's people hated Samaritans. But then Jesus tells a story that shows not all Samaritans were bad. The story may begin with prejudice, discrimination, and animosity, but the Spirit moves God's people towards openness, welcome, inclusion, acceptance, and affirmation. The Bible is a progressive revelation, meaning 
If you read Moses, God was dealing with them in this way. They were babies, by the way. They didn't even know how to live at all. And then you read the prophets, and they started challenging some of the things of Moses because it's a progressive revelation of people dealing with God and working with God, and God always meets people where they're at. So context, history, and most of all, the spirit is the most important thing in reading the Bible. So again, here's just a little history how this went down. Because most of you grew up in a Western evangelical church. And, he, and here's how this went down. In ni- and this was a defining moment. In 1978, they got together this thing called the Chicago Council. And it was a reaction to liberalism in society. And when I say that term today, remember I don't mean your political beliefs. I mean, they started looking, you know, evolution came in and they started getting worried because so many people were believing in evolution and they thought if you believed in evolution, then you couldn't believe in God, which isn't true, by the way. And they just started, they felt this attack. And so they had this counterattack and they got together and, and tried to put, to, they put together this formula of what the Bible is. And here's, where, here's what their statement was. We affirm that scripture is entirely inerrant, meaning it's perfect, being free from all falsehood, fraud, or deceit. Let me say this. First off, I agree with them in some ways about liberalism with the Bible. Um, We always, as humans, we think because we have iPhones that we're smarter than people 50 years ago. We always think we're smarter than people 100 years ago because we have new technology. That's not true. And there are some very serious warnings in this book. There are some very serious warnings, not from an angry father who wants to kill you, but a father who's loving and he doesn't want you to hurt yourself. I am also a student of history. You can trust this about me. I love history. I'm kind of a history nerd. I love it. I have studied history. And things that we think are new in society right now, they've already been tried, it's already happened, and it's failed miserably. It just has. And we always think we're more progressive (laughs) than them. Well, read history. It goes like this, cycles, cycles, cycles. So I agree with them that there's things saying, oh, the Bible doesn't matter. No, the Bible absolutely matters because it continually comes true. It absolutely matters. However, I also see the flip side of what this document did. And I'll show you in the history of how the early church viewed it. When you say that the Bible, what it caused was a flat line reading of the Bible, meaning that means the words of Moses are just as important as the words of Jesus. And basically what it did is it kind of made God (laughs) um, unpredictable. It's like, well, he's mad here. Well, he's he's really mad there, but he's loving here. and And so it made a flat line reading of the Bible. And what that created was fundamentalism. And if you read the Gospels, Jesus was coming hard against fundamentalism. And what that led to then was using this book to abuse people and really to control people. Because you could just say, oh, if you're welcome at this church, you have to believe this, this, and this, and this. And it became coming off of Jesus, the foundation of our faith. Jesus said he's the foundation. He's the rock. He's the cornerstone. And it became using some of these verses in order to get people to align. It created mass fundamentalism. And here's a verse that has been used against me, and here's a verse that I've been seeing on Instagram a lot too. And what this fundamentalism did is it allowed us to create whole theologies and whole denominations taking passages out of context. And it's freaking people out. Listen to this verse. 1 Timothy 4. The Holy Spirit has explicitly revealed at the end of this age, that's important, many will depart from the true faith one after another, devoting themselves to spirits of deception and following demon-inspired revelations and theories. Hypocritical liars will deceive many and their consciences won't bother them at all. I have had this verse used against me as I'm called a heretic. First off, the end of the age, he's talking about the Jewish age. When the destruction of Jerusalem happened, the Jewish age was done, and the Christian age is now it. We are in the Christian age. But secondly, you have to read the next verse. Verse 3, they will require celibacy. I thought that'd get some laughs. (laughs) Come on. Think about certain denominations that have done this. And dietary restrictions. 
that God doesn't expect, for he created all foods to be received with the celebration of faith by those who fully know the truth. We know that all creation is beautiful to God and there is nothing to be refused if it is received with gratitude. All that we eat is made sacred by the word of God and prayer. What was he warning about? Fundamentalism, religion, legalism, restrictions. And we always flip this verse. And the people who usually use this verse don't realize that verse is about them. Because they're always trying to hinder something. Because the good news just seems too good sometimes. The gospel is freedom. And I love my Catholic brothers and sisters. I seriously do. I learn a lot from them. But I think it was a bad idea to make the priest celibate. We're seeing the fruits of that. This was against religion. And we use it against anyone who has a different opinion on things. And that's not what this verse was for. What this fundamentalism did is it killed humility when it comes to the scriptures. Everybody thinks they're right now and everyone thinks they're a theologian. And so what it did is it says, well, you all can interpret this book. And that's just, that, that has caused mass division. Here's the next thing that they said at this council. We affirm that the Holy Scriptures are to be received as the authoritative word of God. I actually agree with that, by the way. We deny that the Scriptures receive, this is, this is the part I disagree with, receive their authority from the church, tradition, or any other human service. This had disastrous effects because we're talking hundreds of years that these early church fathers got together to create theology and create the Nicene Creed and create the creeds in effort to unify the body of Christ. It was to unify it. And what this did is it then allowed every single person to just say, well, I know it's truth and make up your own truth. Church tradition is incredibly important. These guys were martyred for some of this. So whenever you read that they were going against this, it's because they didn't want the Pope making all the rules, and they didn't want the Pope adding new things to the Bible, which he was doing. So when Martin Luther talks about sola scriptura, you know, scripture alone, he wasn't saying that he believed all the scriptures were equal. You read his stuff, he never did. He was saying, we don't need any more books from the Pope. That's what he was saying. But we have taken this to the extreme, and it's caused a mass fundamentalism. Here's what it's done. These are just my views. I believe it's caused us because we always want to be in the majority view, because the majority view always equals safety. Look at what's going on in our society. We think the majority view equals safety, and if we can just get in the right tribe, and that's why, you know, <laughs> okay, I won't get too far into that. That's why, <laughs> thank you, Jesus. That's a good one. We think the majority is always right. Throughout history, it's been proven the majority is rarely right. And let me ask you this. If you're one that wants to get to the majority and you get your commentary Bible and you've got to have this agreement with everyone, name one prophet in the entire Bible that was in the majority. Name one. Jesus wasn't in the majority. John the Baptist wasn't in the majority. None of them were in the majority ever when they came and gave their message. And so what'd they do? They killed them. Now let me ask you. Because we love just crucifying people who have different views on stuff. Let me ask you, how would we even treat some of these Old Testament prophets if they were here today? We would have them committed. Jeremiah slept on his side and cooked his food over poop. We would, would we listen to these guys? We have a lack of humility now We have because we're so hell-bent on being right and being in the majority, and that's what this council did. So, they saw this as a problem, and they went and clarified it later, but listen to how they clarified it. Our doctrine of inerrancy maintains merely that whatever statements the Bible affirms are fully truthful when they are correctly interpreted in terms of their meaning and their cultural setting and the purpose for which they were written. You notice the problem there? Who interprets it? Who's the majority? This did absolutely nothing, calling the Bible inerrant and saying that the words in the Old Testament are the same value as the words of Jesus did nothing to unify because our whole, again, 4,000 denominations, they're all claiming the Bible's perfect and none of them are agreeing with each other and they're all killing each other over theology. It's done nothing. So Pete, he's our youth, our youth director here. 
He's in seminary right now. He's going to a very fine seminary. And it's awesome because he's getting a balanced view from different viewpoints, uh, reformed view, all kinds of stuff. And he's uh, loosely affiliated with the Bible Project. So I highly suggest you guys check out the Bible Project. It's a bunch of guys who are really getting into the culture and the writings, and they do these cool skits about it. They're amazing. But Pete told me, even in seminary, they're all saying we got to get rid of this word inerrant because it's, it's, it's not helping anything, it's not, and it's not how you read the Bible. It's just not how we were meant to read the Bible from a historical standpoint. And let me tell you what it's really done. Do you know that the new atheists like Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, all those guys, they know the Bible. They know the Bible. And what they do is they get in these debates and they show where some of the words of Moses contradict Jesus and some of those words go other ways and they say, see, you can't believe it's true. And many young people are leaving the church because of this. The reason why is they've been told that their foundation and their life is founded on the Bible when really it's founded on Jesus Christ. Your faith and foundation is founded on Jesus Christ. Here's the thing. The Bible is the map that's leading you to the treasure. Are you gonna settle for the map or do you want the treasure? Jesus is the treasure and the Bible's pointing to Jesus, but Jesus is the one who comforts you. Jesus is the one who loves you, not a book. It's a map pointing to the treasure. Again, this, read a, this became a flat line reading and I, I love what Brian Zahn says about this. He's talking about our day and age because there's a lot of people leaving the church, a lot. I'm really happy to see all you today. <laughs> Please don't leave. No. The faith of the future will be sustained by an experience, not an argument. You can either want to experience Jesus Christ, which I believe we do at this church, or we can just get a bunch of information and facts. But the faith of the future is when you experience the risen living Lord. Our goal, my goal, okay, I'll tell you my goal. My goal is not to prove this book all true in every spot. My goal is for you to experience Christ because Jesus said the spirit will lead you into all truth, the spirit. It's an intimate relationship with Christ. And so here's what this did. It created this flat line reading of the Bible and so you can find whatever you wanna find and you actually don't have to follow Jesus. If you don't like the words of Jesus, you can find some place in the Old Testament and disobey him. Listen to Deuteronomy 20, 28. And as the Lord took delight in doing you good and multiplying you, so the Lord will take delight in bringing ruin upon you and destroying you. How does, how does that feel to you? Is that the Jesus you know? Amen, Kale. You're my guy, man. That should rub us the wrong way. Moses was dealing with God in this way. This was his viewpoint. But here's what this did. It's, I mean, this, this pastor is a well-known, recognized pastor, and here's what he said. The moment when you take your first step through the gates of hell, the only thing you will hear is creation standing to its feet and applauding and praising God because God has rid the earth of you. That's how not good you are. This is totally accepted as defining the character of our God. And then you get to Ezekiel. And Ezekiel said, for I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord. So who are you with? Who are you with? You get to First Chronicles and it says this, then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the army, go and number Israel. So Satan told them to do it. You go to 2 Samuel 24, though. If you read Samuel in Chronicles, it's describing the same events in two different ways. And he, but Samuel was, or, uh, Chronicles was written hundreds of years after Samuel. So here's what Samuel said. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them. So who was it? Was it God? Or was it Satan who tempted David? Fast forward to the New Testament where they had the lens of Jesus Christ and he says, when you are tempted, don't ever say God is tempting me for God is incapable of being tempted by evil and he is never the source of temptation. He corrected him because he knew Jesus. Again, here's the crazy part. 
Even Calvin didn't view the Bible this way. Luther definitely didn't view the Bible this way. He saw so many errors in the King James Version, he created his own German version. And it's the most read version in all of Europe. And in Luther's version, he took out the books of Jude, Hebrews, Revelation, uh, and James because he thought they weren't inspired. He literally took those books out. T.F. Torrance, who I told you about during Advent, He's one of the most well-known theologians in the world. And he was a reformer, by the way. But he said this, we came up with the idea of inerrancy because we needed another mediator between God and man other than Jesus. The safest place to hide from Jesus is in religion and you can hide from Jesus in the Bible because Jesus is an encounter. Jesus is a relationship. Jesus is speaking to you. And we can just hide behind these verses instead of encountering Jesus Christ. So here's, I just thought of this example, right? What kind of relationship would you have with your spouse? Let's just say your wife or any relationship. And they say to you, if you wanna be married to me, here's the list of things you have to do. Some of you are like, that's how my marriage is going. <laughs> that's a bad relationship. And then they give you a list and you must say my wife was like, okay, I want you to mow the lawn. But in one section it says to mow the lawn here. And in another section it says to mow the lawn there. And I'm in the lawn or I'm in the yard going, hmm. What do you do? Huck and pray? Ask her. <laughs> Communicate with her. Be like, what did you mean by this? This is why Jesus is the word of God because we can take these passages, we can look at the life of Jesus who is our list, who is our model and say, it doesn't line up with Jesus so therefore I choose Jesus. That's the relationship. That is the progressive revelation of the Bible. The Apostle Paul is probably our greatest example of this. The Apostle Paul was a, a, a philosophical genius, but also a biblical genius. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. As I said, you had to memorize the Torah. You had to memorize by heart the first five books of the Bible. This is no dummy. And he was a fundamentalist, and he used the Old Testament as a way to justify killing Christians. The Apostle Paul was Saul before he was Paul, and he killed Christians. After that, he met Jesus. And I can show you tons of spots in the New Testament where Paul retranslated the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus. He literally cut some parts out because he said, that was Moses, that wasn't Jesus. Here's one example. Deuteronomy 21. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God. This is obviously a prophecy of Jesus Christ on the cross. Paul quotes this in Galatians, and he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed by everyone who hangs on a tree. Did you catch anything there? Paul took out the part, cursed by God. Because in his new revelation of Jesus, he knew God doesn't curse people. God blesses people. God loves people. We curse ourselves. Our sin punishes itself. And so he literally retranslated that passage through the lens of Jesus Christ, saying, the God I know curses nobody. And he had the right to do that. I love what one man says about Paul. He says, Saul was a biblical literalist who weaponized the scriptures to justify killing Christians. Saul worshiped the book. Paul worshiped the Christ. It's true, I can give you tons of those where Paul said, nope, 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 and he used it. Paul, Saul was a fundamentalist, and Paul was free in love to discover the truth through Jesus Christ. Here's the verse that's off, it's really the only verse that's used trying to prove that all the Bible's equal. And it's 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and beneficial, that's a key word, beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness. And so at this council, they jumped to the conclusion and said, well, if it's inspired by God, then it has to be perfect because God is perfect. But is that really what Paul was saying here? First off, when Paul says the scriptures, he was referring to the Old Testament because the New Testament had not been written yet. He was referring to the Old Testament. 
And yes, it was inspired by God, but he was constantly saying, remember when Paul said, you have to rightly divide the word of truth. He said it. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. What is of Jesus and what was of man? You have to divide that. Also, Paul used a lot of different books than we even use today. Paul used the book of wisdom, Sirach, the Tobit. He considered all of these to be scripture. I was talking to a friend about this who was really, he was really struggling with this. And I asked him, I said, have you ever read the book of Enoch? The book of Enoch, it's not in the Bible. And he goes, yeah, it's crazy. And I said, well, have you ever read the book of Jude? Jude is in the Bible, and Jude quotes the book of Enoch. These guys had lots of letters. They, 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 they didn't look at him the way we do. He quotes the book of Enoch. Look at Enoch, the seventh direct descendant from Adam, prophesied of their doom when he said, look, here comes the Lord Yahweh in his myriads of holy ones. He comes to execute judgment against them all and to convict each one of them for their ungodly deeds and for all the terrible words that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That is the book of Enoch. And if you've read the book of Enoch, it is crazy, but it actually is a very prophetic book as well. Here's another shock. The book, the Bibles that you and I use in America are not the same as the ones used in the world, other places in the world. I've said this before, we need some humility. <laughs> we Protestants think we're the majority view. We are the minority in the world when it comes to the church. So listen to this, our book has 66 letters in it, 66 letters. The Catholic Church, their Bible has 73 books in it. The Ethiopian church, which is one of the most recognized and, uh, and loved by the, the world church, has 81 books in their Bible, including the book of Enoch and including the book of Jubilees. The Ethiopian church is an amazing church. They are direct descendants from when the Ethiopian eunuch met Philip on the road and got baptized and went back and shed the gospel. Some people believe they are hiding the Ark of the Covenant. I think his name was uh, Steven Spielberg said that. But <laughs> these are real Christians who have said, no, these books should be included. These books are included in our thing. David Bentley Hart is one of the most... Um, renowned theologians in the world. Not everyone agrees with him, but they don't even debate him anymore. He's super smug, he's kind of a jerk, but they don't even debate him because he's just a historical genius. And here's one objection that I hear all the time, and I understand your heart. I understand people's heart, but they say, I believe in a God big enough to make sure this book stayed perfect. I do too. The problem is, we don't have any of the original manuscripts, none of them. We have zero original manuscripts. And the early church fathers were already, they were fighting the Gnostics. The Gnostics were adding to the Bible. They were trying to introduce new things. They were already had copyists, copyists who were adding to the Bible. And David Henley Bentley Hart says this. He says, there is no single definitive text of the New Testament. Testament canon. Among the oldest manuscripts we have, no text in the New Testament nor any complete collection of the New Testament text who agrees with each other's version. If you read the Gospels, they're giving you different accounts of what happened at the resurrection. It's just people's different opinions. They are literally different accounts of the resurrection. This presents a problem for the literalist believer in verbal inspiration. For indeed, an absolutely pure text of scripture somewhere exists. We have no notion whatsoever where it is to be found. During the first several centuries of the church, it was widely known that there was a great variety of different versions of the biblical text. And this seemed to perturb no one very much. They weren't freaked out about it. In fact, it was many centuries before what we regard as the New Testament canon gained universal acceptance. In many places, books we do not now tend to regard as canonical were treated as sacred scripture, while other books that we assume to be part of Christian scripture were either unknown or rejected as dubious. Basically, even some, if you read some of the new translations, they have brackets around things because they're saying this was added hundreds of years later. Now, do I think we learn from it? Yeah. Do I think it's scripture? Yeah. But we need to come at this with a little humility because there's not one New Testament fragment that actually agrees with the other. So, I mean, they agree in the main points, but there's some discrepancies for sure. So here's my thing. Here's, here's my counter to that. 
Why didn't Jesus write one book when he was here? Don't, wouldn't you have loved him to write one book and clear all this up? Jesus, just write it down for us. Because he's about relationship, and you know where he did write his book? On your hearts. The Bible clearly says in Joel, he wrote it on your hearts. He lives inside of you, and he wants this relationship, not this fundamentalist, stagnant viewpoint. So how did, oh, and on top of that, why did he talk in parables? He spoke in parables so we could eat it, so we could discover it, so we could research it, so we could think about it, so we could grow in it. He spoke this way because he wants relationship with us, not fundamentalism. So how did the early church view this? Again, they were fighting the Gnostics and copyists, adding things, all types of stuff. Athanasius, the guy we talked about during Advent, said this. The holy scriptures given by inspiration of God are of themselves sufficient toward the discovery of truth. The Catholic Christians, that word Catholic means world church, not the Catholic church. It just means the world church will neither speak nor endure to hear anything in religion that is a stranger to scripture, it being an evil heart of immodesty to speak those things which are not written. Again, they were fighting the Gnostics, they were fighting the Arminians, and they were trying to add things. And they were saying, we don't need outside opinion in this. But look at the next line of this quote. But beyond these scriptural sayings, let us look at the very tradition, teaching, and faith of the Catholic Church from the beginning, which the Lord gave, the apostles preached, and the fathers kept. What that means is, outside of Scripture, we have the faith handed down to us where they interpreted it for us. And this is why I've taken us on this journey this year, because the Western Church has completely negated these guys in so many ways. When Alexandria, the school of Alexandria, was started by John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark is the original gospel that the other gospels fed off of. The school of Alexandria started by John Mark. They say his bones are still there. He studied under Paul, Barnabas, and... Uh, Peter. He had a pretty good view of the faith handed down to us. So they were saying, it's not just scripture, it's the interpretation that was handed down to us that is incredibly important. And when we became fundamentalists and we said, it's just a free-for-all now, everyone thought they had their own interpretation and it screwed the entire church up and the dark ages came. It's proven history. These guys lived and breathed scripture, but they believed their final authority was Jesus Christ and they had to rightly divide the word of truth through the lens of Jesus Christ. And here's one thing, I can tell you what I do. I think we have negated the Jewish perspective. When I study these scriptures, especially the Old Testament, in the New, I study them from a Jewish perspective because we think because they're not Christians that they don't wor they're not worth listening to. These people are biblical geniuses. These rabbis know history, they know culture. They just miss their own Messiah. I study them. We should be hearing what the Jews think about some of this Old Testament stuff, and you can find it. So that's what I do when I study this. Here's another version of 1 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is breathed out by God. God breathed. And profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So... We've taken this one verse and made all the Bible equal, and the problem I have with that is look at the word. It says it's profitable, it's useful. The Old Testament is filled with wisdom. The Proverbs are filled with wisdom. It helps you, it's profitable. It never says it's detrimental to your health because Jesus is your word of God. Jesus is speaking to you. Jesus is the final authority in all things. And if that word God breathed, Yes, that means it was inspired. You know who else is God breathed? You. Your God breathed. Have you ever gotten some things wrong about God in your journey? My friends, I have preached sermons from 10 years ago that I completely disagree with now. And I love the grace of God, how he covered everything. He covered it and he still used it, even in my ignorance, because it says his word never comes back void. But I have been wrong about God. I have been wrong about him. Jesus never wrote a word because he wrote it on your hearts and you are the God-breathed message of Jesus Christ and he's speaking to you and he is the one who is guiding and directing you. I love what Brian Zahn says about this. He says, we all make errors in theology, you and me both. So my recommendation is to err on the side of love. 
Why? Because God is not doctrine. God is not denomination. God is not war. God is not law. God is not hate. God is not hell. God is love. Amen. One of the verses that's often used to try to affirm this is Hebrews 13, eight. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. But what do we know about Jesus Christ? We know about him in the gospels. So we are called to start with the gospels and use Jesus, the only one who's ever seen God. I'll talk about this more next week. Please, please listen. The only one who's ever seen God, the only one who's the perfect God-breathed man, he is the one who showed us the truth. And so they use this as a way to say, well, see, that's the same Jesus back in the Old Testament. Well, let me ask you something. How many of you here think we should still have slavery? The fact is, is we do have slavery on this planet still. My friend is a human trafficking agent, and he said it's not just sexual slavery. There's real slavery in this world. In China, in Africa, there's real slavery. How many of you think that's wrong? Why? Because in the Old Testament, we see a lot of it. And during the time of the Civil War, when they were trying to outlaw slavery, it was the Christian fundamentalists who used the Bible, and they called the abolitionists heretics. Listen to these quotes. Those who are opposed to slavery are engaged in willful or conscious opposition to the truth. Who are we that in our modern wisdom presume to set aside the word of God and invert for ourselves a higher law than those holy scriptures which are given to us as a light to our feet and a lamp to our paths must answer. Listen to this one. Opponents of slavery decide in advance what the Bible ought to speak and then turn in over in order to see how they can make it speak what they wish. I can't even begin to tell you how many times people have said to me, you just want to make the Bible say whatever it says. I'm like, no. They use that same argument trying to outlaw slavery. When Moses speaks the words of God of the Hebrews, it is for us to listen, not to call into question. Why do we all agree that slavery is wrong now? It is never condemned in the New Testament either. Why can we all sit here and agree this is wrong? Because Jesus Christ is still speaking and he's bringing humanity forward because he is the word of God. And he meets every generation where they're at. And I'm here to tell you, 100 years from now, they're gonna look back at our generation and point out things that we did wrong. But Jesus is moving humanity forward because he is the word of God and he's speaking. But the Bible never condemns it. Let me say this. I have never loved this book more now that I actually know how to interpret it and read it. I've never loved this book more. I study it. I love it. But I want to live by the words of Jesus. I hear people say there's a danger in this because then people will pick and choose what they want. People are already picking and choosing what they want. My dear friends, I pray you pick and choose Jesus' words because his words will never fade away. His words are life. Pick Jesus' words. Again, if you want to make all the Bible equal and you want to say have a fundamentalist viewpoint, that's okay. I think you should start with the 10% tithe. The Old Testament commands you give 10% of your income to the church. I suggest you start with that one. See what I'm saying? Here's what Jesus said. In John 5, to the religious fundamentalists, he said, you examine the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is those very scriptures that testify about me. You think your theology is gonna save you, so we divide and we split churches and we call people out and we call them heretics and it's doing nothing to advance the body of Christ and millions of people are leaving the church because of it. But when we start taking the words of Jesus seriously, that he is the word of God, it is nothing that can be more attractive than a life lived like Jesus Christ. Band, you can come on up. So next week, we're gonna talk about Jesus being the word. But what this passage proves to me is that you can quote the Bible and actually be on the side of Satan. 
because it's being used as a weapon and a place to harm. So I'm begging for some humility. I'm begging for you to, to, to work through this process and come and listen to this next week. But I started my sermon out with Hebrews 4. It says, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, even penetrating as far as the division of soul and spirit or both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now let's look at verse 13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him to whom we must answer. This verse was about Jesus Christ because Jesus is the word of God and Jesus is the one who knows our hearts and judges our hearts and our intentions and everything. This verse, Jesus is the double-edged sword. And the cool part about this is this sounds like he's being violent. That bone and marrow passage when he, in Greek, it actually means he's gonna inject himself into every part of your being and soul and spirit and body and clean out every disease that's hurting you because he's the great physician that's who I worship. Here, here's why, I, okay, I'll just be honest. Like, I'm a violent man. I want to hurt those who hurt me. Those who slander me. Those who've tried to destroy my life. I want to hurt them. And I can think, yeah, I can bench like 320. I'd mop those people up. And you know what? I can find in Joshua, I can find in Joshua that I have a right to do that. But then I read Jesus. He's like, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Turn the other cheek and you will be called the son of the most high God. Who am I going to choose? And it's hard and it goes against everything in my nature to shut this stupid mouth and I can find it in Moses. I can say, no, he called those people out and I need to call these people out. And then I see Jesus, who was the lamb slain, who stood before Pilate. And Pilate was like, all these people are accusing you. And he says, are you have nothing to say? And it says, he did not open his mouth. And it's incredibly difficult. But those are the words of life. And that is how you become a child of God. Who are you gonna choose? I leave you with this quote and then we're gonna take communion. And the beauty of the communion table is there's no division here. No matter where you land on this, no matter where you land on that, no matter where your, your heart is, no matter what sins you have, no matter what, we all come as helpless children to receive the grace of Jesus Christ. This should be the place that gets all of that out. And we're gonna do it today. But I leave you with this quote and it's just so true. If you are looking for verses with which to support slavery, you will find them. If you are looking for verses with which to abolish slavery, you will find them. If you are looking for verses with which to oppose women, you will find them. If you are looking for verses with which to liberate or honor women, you will find them. If you are looking for reasons to wage war, you will find them. If you are looking for reasons to promote peace, you will find them. If you are looking for an outdated, irrelevant, ancient text, you will find it. If you are looking for truth, believe me, you will find it. And I suspect Jesus knew this when he said, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened. If you want to do violence in this world, you will always find the weapons. And if you want to heal, you will always find the balm. In the name of the Father and the Son, in the Holy Spirit, amen.